You know, one of the things we do here at Bob Jones is we're supposed to make you college and career ready. The other thing that I think we need to do is we, we need to make you life ready, okay? And so what I want to do, and, and, and when, when this opportunity came up, I thought I can't think of an, a better person than I've ever known to, uh, to come and speak to you guys about real life and about getting prepared for life after high school than uh, Lee Deckelman. So let me tell you a little bit about Lee. Lee Deckelman graduated from Tillahoma High School in 1984 and is the father of two. In the Army, Lee became an Airborne Ranger and earned the Distinguished Leadership Award in Ranger Indoctrination. He served as team leader in the 1st Ranger Battalion in Savannah, Georgia, and also served in Operation Desert Storm. He joined the Green Berets and completed this Elite Special Forces Assessment and Selection course. In the medic course, he received the Best Medic Award. After 15 years and in 2000, he retired because of a service-related injury. As a civilian, Lee joined the Rutherford County EMS Department and became a member of the Sheriff's Department's Tactical Response Team, FAST, where he developed the Tactical Medic Selection Course, which motivated him to form Dixie Tactical Medicine. Everything changed for Lee, uh, for the U.S. and Lee on September 11, 2001. He served in the War on Terror as a Federal Air Marshal and after two years left the NTSB to join Special Operations Soldiers and served in Iraq as a pr uh, private security contractor. Lee worked for Triple Canopy, Blackwater, Special Operations Consulting Security Management Group, EODT, USIS, and the Olive Group. Over, eight, over an eight-year period, Lee and his teammates survived countless attacks in Iraq and Afghanistan without losing one person. Protecting their highest profile asset, U.S. diplomat and future Ambassador Stu Jones resulted in over 20 firefights. In 2012, Lee switched to the executive protection field. His clients included Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg, hedge fund billionaire Daniel Loeb, and Courtney Sales Ross, widow of former CEO uh, Steve Ross of Time Warner. Lee founded the Echelon Gray Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to ensure private security contractors that supported the global war on terror could receive health care support once they return home. Mental health and suicide prevention is its primary focus. From Baghdad to Benghazi, formal sp special operations personnel have answered the call to protect top government off officials in war zones for 13 years only to be forgotten once their contract ended. The slogan for Lee's foundation and his life mission is, no one gets left behind at home. Lee is currently working on a book, Fire and Forget Soldier, with co-author Richard Ridley. His hope is that by bringing attention to the private security sector, he'll be able to raise awareness for all of those who serve their country in a non-traditional yet crucial roles. You know, a lot of times we think we know who we are, but it's also important who do people think we are. So one of the things I did is I talked or I reached out to some of those that Lee has served with and said, when you think of Lee Deckman, tell me what you think of. And I don't know if you've even heard these or seen these yet. So I'm going to read you a couple of things of what people who have served with this man say. Don't worry, I've edited some of it. Committed to his faith, his family, his country, his mission, and his team members, never letting them down. That's Colonel Tom Kirkbride. A great father and a man I'm proud to call my friend, Todd Comment. I watched two medics work on one man with three bullet holes from one bullet. I watched Lee itching to do it better, but respectful enough not to step on toes, uh, he didn't do anything. When I had seen enough, I said, Lee, and the situation was in hand. The man knows what he's doing and why he's doing it. Strictly business. Mark Birmingham. Two words describe Lee Deckelman. Infectious tenacity. Because if you spend five minutes with Lee, he can make you believe you're capable of doing anything. Richard Ridley. As one of my military shirts says, an army of one. That pretty much sums up Lee Deckelman. That's James Wilson. I, I had to throw this one in, Lee. A scrappy little redheaded kid who went from showing up to Pop Warner football practice with a bicycle chain around his neck to, to becoming a dedicated soldier father and now a grandfather, Lee Brown. I've known Lee Deckelman since, uh, since I was born. Um, you know, there's a lot of things I could say about this guy, and we don't have enough time. Um, I've seen this man uh, from the early days when you're, you're at your age and earlier as we grew up. I've seen this man go through an awful lot from a personal standpoint. But the one thing that he never did is he never gave up. Never gave up. 
and I'm proud to say that he is my friend, and that's the one thing. If I look at everything that I can say about Lee Deckelman, the only thing I can say is he, he's a friend. He's a dear friend. Uh, he's a patriot. You're a patriot. He's a warrior, and I'm glad he's here today. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to, to, to listen to what he's got to say uh, and really, really take note. And then afterwards, we'll have some time for questions and answers. But I want to introduce to you Lee Deckelman. I'd like to thank uh, Vice Principal Quick. I think he's principal today, right? Acting principal today, and uh, Colonel Hurd. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, the cadet class and uh, uh, the history class. It, it's an honor to be here. Um, getting uh, Vice Principal uh, Quick to sell that only cost about a hundred bucks, so uh, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, but no, I, uh, I I went too long in the last class, so I'm really going to burn through this. So when we get to the question and answer part, if there's a slide you see or something I hint on or, or something you're already thinking about that you want to talk to me about, this really isn't about me talking to you. It's really about me trying to help you, and we can't do that unless I get to the question and answer part. So I'm really going to burn through it this time, and we're going to have a lot more time on the other end um, to talk and ask questions. You know, if you want to know what it's like at Facebook or you want to know, you know, the, the little things that maybe I won't focus any time on because, um, you know, I think, that maybe you want to hear something different. So, so just keep that in mind. But one thing is, my disclaimer, you know, I don't go around dro dropping F-bombs, but, you know, I'm not politically correct. Um, and I don't want to be. And I think after you hear my life story and where I've been and done, you'll, you'll take me at face value and see that I'm a very patriotic, very passionate person um, who doesn't filter th uh, things through all these negative things anyway. And um, so just bear with me as we go through this. I'm going to burn through it. And um, we'll just go from there. So we're going to talk about my life a little bit, a lot quicker version this time. Um, we're going to talk about the foundation, Echelon Gray Foundation, why. Um, that's my new life mission. Um, I'm going to give you some tools for your toolbox. Now, you think about it. If an ambulance shows up to pick you up and there ain't nothing in the ambulance, then that's just a taxi cab ride, right? So the paramedic that picks you up is only as good as the tools that are in that box. It's the same thing with your brain, okay? You gotta have some tools up there to sort things out. And look, life is easy when it's easy. You gotta have tools to get you through the hard times. That's when you gotta check yourself and still sort yourself out. So we're gonna give you a couple tools uh, that's helped me out. The one thing about me is, is I'm, I'm hardwired and I'm hard-headed and I'm a doer, and for most of my life, I didn't listen to anybody else, and so I made a lot of mistakes. And so these are tools that are time-proven um, over my lifetime. So you might hear the high points in my life, like, wow, that guy was a Green Beret, or he was a Ranger, or spent nine years in combat, or you know, uh, worked for Mark Zuckerberg doing protection, or, or whatever it is. But at the end of the day, I made a lot more mistakes than I did um, have positive effects in my life. So what I'm telling you today, I'm passionate about and hopefully it'll help somebody. Maybe there's another Lee Deckelman in the audience today that I can talk to and save them 20 years of crap um, by paying attention today. And uh, so that's kind of my goal. And the question and answer, we've got to get to that quick because I really want to hear what you have to say. And if you don't have to say anything, then I'm going to go back to these other slides and keep talking. So you better have some good questions for me. That was a joke. If y'all start laughing, we'll do push-ups. If y'all start laughing, we'll do push-ups. God, all right. I don't know what you came from for the next class. So, I'm um, oh, sorry, go back one. So, real quick on my life. I spent too much on this last time because I wanted to prove a point. But here's the bottom line. My father was Jewish and was from Baltimore. My mother was a Christian from Tennessee. All right, there, there, was, a, there was a confusing scenario from day one. When I was born, I was two and a half months pre premature. Um, I weighed four pounds and I was cross-eyed. By the time I was two, my eyes were straight, but I was in foster care, living um, in a foster home. By age six, I was back with my family, moved to Tennessee. By age nine, my dad was dead of a heart attack, and things continued to get worse. So things didn't get better. They got worse. And you know what happened? Nobody had to tell me this. You know what happened 
as far back as I can remember, I was like, you know what? You can curl up or you can bow up. And I bowed up. And I'm not talking about bowing up, just going around uh, being a bully or being stupid. It was like when life hit me hard, I wasn't going to lay down. And I didn't care who it was or what it was. And that was just the way I was wired. So it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter whatever. You can be a rock star if you've got that gravel in your gut. You know what I mean? If you really want something, and no matter what, you're going to figure out. But, you know, it's not going to be there's going to be, there. As you, as you see, as we go through, there's going to be some hard times. So look at that rock star right there. Look at that. Second grade. Look at that red hair, freckles, tie. So I look cute in that picture. You're thinking, oh, I don't get it. He's cute. You know, he didn't have a hard life. Um, that's the only picture I have when I was younger that's actually cute. So that's why I put it up there. But there's my first home ever. I revisited last year to my foster home. And, and that's where I spent the first years of my life that I remember. So, and as I said, things went, you know, I was age 14, my mother tried to kill me with a butcher knife, for example. Um, you know, it just continued to get worse. And the only thing that made it better, the first real turning point in my life was football. I could take out my demons on other people. So I was a sophomore. Is there anybody in here that's 5'3"? Stand up. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, it's, there's nothing funny about that. How, how much you weigh? I was 5'3 and weighed 132 as a sophomore, and I was the only starter on the football team. That's how big I was. I was a starting strong safety for um, one of the best football programs at the time in Warren County as a sophomore. That's how bad I wanted to play football. So don't tell me, oh, I'm too small. You, I'm sorry, you can sit down. Don't tell me, oh, I'm too this or I'm too that. If you want something, you can figure it out. You can sort it out. And so I, I wanted to be a good – and the reason why I wanted to be a good football player is because my dad was a good football player. Imagine being nine years old, your dad die, your whole world fall apart, and it's like he was my hero, and he's still my hero today. That's my fuel to be somebody because at the end of the day, when they do the math and they talk about the story of your life, it's either a good story or it's going to be a bad story. It's going to fall into a category – and only you can decide how that turns out. So this is my dad. If you want to check out something cool about me, check out something cool about my dad. Because you know what my dad gave me? He wasn't here to mentor me. He gave me his DNA. He gave me his last name. And I take pride in that. I take pride in that. I take pride in being from Tullahoma, Tennessee. And I take pride in my country. And I put my money where my mouth is. And I put my ass where my mouth is. You see what I'm saying? It, it isn't just a bunch of talk. You know, you got to be able to walk the walk. And I think I've done that, and I think that gives me the right to stand up here and act like that. But you look like, you look up Arthur Deckelman, City College, 1936, state championship game, and uh, it was a pretty amazing uh, event that happened uh, involving my father. So military, the most positive turning point in my life. Looking back on my life, everything, the most positive thing. I'm not trying to tell everybody to go join the military. I'm telling you, it was the best thing. Thing I ever did. I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't have worked for Zuckerberg. I wouldn't have worked for Dan Loeb. I wouldn't have been a Green Beret. I wouldn't have been a Ranger. I wouldn't have been an Air Marshal. Blah, blah, blah. The list goes on and on. I wouldn't have done any of that. Not one bit of that had I not gone in the military. This is me graduating Ranger School in uh, 1987. Returning home from Desert Storm um, from 90 to 91. Got out for a little bit, thought I'd try the civilian world. Grown up a little bit, thought, uh, thought I was ready for it. Got out, there wasn't no jobs. There wasn't a whole lot of jobs that needed, uh, back then it was before 9-11, you know, not a whole lot of jobs that needed, uh, you know, uh, rangers, um, you know, that skill set, um, you know, welcome to Walmart, you know, come here. <laughs> you know, I mean, nobody, you know, like, where are you gonna get a job being a ranger, you know? so. So it didn't work out real well. So I went back in the Army and went to Savannah, Georgia. Um, wanted to mention this. My son is now serving in Savannah, Georgia in 1st Ranger Battalion as a Ranger. Followed my, he was born there, um, and he's following my footsteps. And so, you know, another positive thing that I did in my life, you know, 30 years later had a profound positive effect. You know, seeds that you're planting right now, things that you're doing or not doing right now, there are, I know your parents tell you, oh, it's going to come back around. It is. You live long enough, it's going to come, all of it. 
It's going to come back around. So if you're doing the right thing, planting the right seeds, good stuff's going to come back around. It, it, it really is simple math, figuring that stuff out. So, um, you know, I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to go on and be a Green Beret now. I did the Ranger thing, you know. Didn't put a lot of thought into it. Just I, I, I like the idea of, of wanting to try to be a Green Beret. So, uh, so I went and did it. And um, which one am I in that picture? Which one do you think I am? That's right. So from here on out, <laughs> I'm not paying you any more money. From here on out, from here on out, when I pull up a picture, just go to the shortest one because I'm the shortest one in every picture. And you think that bothers me? No, because I can sit up here and laugh about it. It doesn't matter. You are what you are. You got what you got. You know, uh, do positive things with it. Figure it out. Make people get excited about being around you instead of can't waiting to get away from you. You know what I'm saying? All right, so I'm not going to go into the story, but there's a book being written about my life right now that's in final editing phase. And it goes into this botched surgery that the military did and um, all the complications that came from it. And you can't sue the military, so they put me out on a medical discharge or whatever with some little stipend or whatever. So they robbed me of the opportunity of retiring from the military with full benefits and everything. It sent my life once again into a, a tailspin after all the due diligence and hard work and trying to do the right thing, um, you know, uh, and that's just life. So my point is, is during all this, it led to a divorce, which the most important thing in my life, if you think about the way I, was, I grew up, was my family. And, and all that was getting ready to get ripped away, and I've been doing the right thing. So I could, have, I could have sat there and said, oh, you know, it's this and that. And that. But no, you know what? Life's going to hand you shit sandwiches, and you're going to have to take the shit with the sugar. You're going to have to smile. You're going to have to figure out and move out because it doesn't matter. You curl up, whine, oh, it's this person. Fought. You think that makes you feel better about yourself, or you think anybody thinks anything better of you? At the end of the day, the movie about your life that's being played right now in the theater, what, what is it going to say? Not the, not the one you convinced everybody, not that movie, the real movie. The, the, the movie that you know, the stuff that you do that nobody else knows about, the real person. That movie about your life, what's it going to look like? Well, guess what? You get to decide what each day of your life in that movie looks like. You really do. You've got to take responsibility and take charge of your life. If you don't, you're just going to be wadded up on the side of the road um, feeling sorry for yourself for a long, long time. So. 9-11 happened soon after that. I needed something positive to happen. 9-11 wasn't positive, but the response to 9-11 was. I'd been put out of the military um, prematurely. We were going to war. I trained all my life to go to war. And, and now what am I doing? I'm working as a paramedic in Rutherford County, which was a, a, a great thing. It was a great experience. Um, but I wasn't answering the call for the global war on terror. So, when the opportunity to become a federal air marshal came up, I spent about two years flying on airplanes um, trying to make sure that 9-11 didn't happen again. Um, that led to a job with Triple Canopy. In 2004, in the beginning of the year, Triple Canopy was the premier security company on the planet. Best guys, best equipment, best pay. All the original members were ex-Delta Force. To be a part of the original group, which is about 150 to 200 guys, which I was a part of, you had to have combat experience, special ops background. Wake him up back there. I know he can't be that bored that quick. Um, and uh, so, and plus you had to be vetted by one of the Delta Forces guys that's already in the, in the community, okay? In addition to that, you had to go to a 10-day selection course which is like a mini Delta course, uh, Delta selection course. So, you know, getting that job wasn't, wasn't a joke. Um, it was one of the challenging, most challenging processes I had ever gone through as a civilian to go fight the war. So the people involved with that program at that time were pretty awesome. This is for you history guys, well, military guys too. That's Mr. Bremer, Ambassador Bremer. That's Ambassador Stu Jones. He's a current ambassador of Iraq right now. He, he was our, the guy that we were protecting in 2004. That's me right there. And um, so there you go. Day one, 
This is a Pee Wee and a Pig Pen. I use all call signs. Um, both ex Delta Force guys. Uh, they went downtown. They 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 were the leadership of uh, Team Miami, and uh, but it was just those two going downtown. Stu Jones, the guy that I just showed you, him and his staff were blown up. Uh, this is day one. This is day one. So you know, day one, you're thinking about, well, what are we having for lunch, and you know, how do I get paid? No, this is day one, downtown, blown up, vehicle don't move anymore. What's getting ready to happen? We don't know. We've got to get the hell out of here. So that's day one stuff right there. This is uh, our ship leader, uh, smuggler, and just some more. Uh, that, that's kind of a little bit of RPG uh, damage, but it's no big deal. Every day doing combat PSD in a play in a combat zone has the potential of Benghazi. All right, Benghazi is all over the news, and, and they talk about former Navy SEALs. Yeah, they're former Navy SEALs that are security contractors now over there protecting somebody that got killed, and now nobody wants to talk about it. Same difference. There's hundreds of thousands of security contractors since 9-11, just like myself, former military, that have answered the call of civilians, and nobody wants to talk about it. That's the whole reason for my foundation. We're going to change that. So this is one of the days at the government center which was our primary venue um, where it gets attacked, seven people were killed, and uh, just, another day in, uh, just another day in Ramadi. Um, this is, uh, that's me right there, um, uh, before I got old and ugly. Um, uh, that's the window that's right over there that you guys can check out, and there's bags on the driver of that vehicle. That's just another ambush that we were in, one of the 20, and uh, that was a significant one, though. Here's a double A. Um, killing an enemy sniper with an RPG. We took their RPGs and killed them with it. Uh, this is me right here. This, this street normally looks like downtown Atlanta. St when it starts shooting, that's how it clears. Uh, Pigpen just happened to take a picture of me right after the shooting started, and a guy jumped out right here with an AK-47 about 15 minutes after this, and that was the first guy I ever killed over there. So usually in the question part, People want to talk about killing. Did you kill somebody? Yes, I did. That wasn't the only person I killed. And so, you know, that, that question's out of the way. Um, this is, uh, if we get time and questions, uh, remind me to go back over the bank robbery story. This is probably one of the coolest stories um, that we had over there. And um, so that's, uh, that's me right there protecting the godfathers, the AIC. That's myself and uh, um, Pigpen, the project manager, uh, pulling security that day. It wasn't all work. We had fun. Here's uh, myself and Snake uh, having some wine in Venice. Um, here we are racing some military combat choppers. Um, so it was a real deal. In 2004, it really was like a movie. I mean, it's the weirdest crap in the world. You know, it's like somebody starts shooting, then like a horse would run down the road. And you just hear it, click, 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 click. And you're like, where in the hell did that horse come from? What, uh, yeah, who, who thinks of this stuff? And, and so when I see movies now about war, wars and they, they interject some weird stuff, it's like, I get it. There was something really weird that happened and, and they found that out and they added it in the movie. I, I mean, it's, it's just damn bizarre. So here's a, here's a picture of Team Miami. Um, the reason why I put this picture up here is the August 10th ambush uh, that led to that window and some other damage, whatever. They came out on both sides of the road, RPG gunners on both sides of the road, you know, and, and, we, and, we, and we survived. I mean, we weren't supposed to survive that. I mean, there, you know, there was a lot of folks and a lot of bad things. So we got back. That was August 10th. We got back. This is August 11th. We lined everybody up. We had never taken a team photo before. We lined everybody up. And the whole reason why we did this is because we knew all of us weren't going to live. And so we, we decided we got to take a, and so that's what makes that significant. But as the, sat, as the stats turn out, um, and uh, that we didn't lose a man with over 20 attacks um, without a scratch on the person we were protecting, who is now the ambassador, Stu Jones, to Iraq uh, as we speak right now. Um, Team Miami, historically, um, is one of the most successful and battle-proven teams in the history of, of America. And, um, you know, you, you, you can't really look back and find a better group that was put together. And I'm, and I'm just proud that I was a part of it. It was a pretty amazing time. Um, what I want to talk about in this part, before I get long-winded, is the NIDA fund. 
the puppy rescue mission. Anybody cares about dogs, write down the puppy rescue mission and go to the NIDA fund. The puppy rescue mission has been helping soldiers and security contractors get uh, rescue animals overseas and get them home for years. They were helping me in 2000, in 2011, I, this was a, a team six that I was working with with Blackwater on the, Af, on the Iranian border. And um, so uh, we, uh, I adopted Nita and uh, started raising her and, and fell in love with her. And so when I sent her home, it cost $6,000 to send her home. When I sent her home, she died of parvo. She never made it back to America and I never saw her again. And it's the only thing in nine, in nine years of combat, it's the only thing I don't like talking about, so. Hmm. Uh, so, anyways, uh, teaching my son firsthand the cost. Um, he just went in the Army. And um, uh, uh, did I cover it already? Because now I'm confused because I already gave this briefing once. So I covered it already. Um, so he's serving as a ranger right now in my old unit. But before he went, I wanted to take him to Moyoc, to Blackwater Compound, and um, show him some of my friends that are being remembered at that memorial and it, explain to him the cost. There's 1,500 uh, contractors that have given their life since 9-11 um, in the global war on terror. And, and I wanted to, him to see that and experience him. There's not a memorial. Um, to, to recognize uh, the 1,500 people just like me that didn't make it home, that were security contractors prior military. But Eric Prince, who's been vilified, is a, is, he's a great man. And uh, he was a great person to work for. It was a great company. Um, and, uh, you know, so what he did with that private memorial, I, I just wanted to add that. What do you guys think about the current state of affairs? Pretty scary, huh? What's going on? I'm going to tell you what, right, they're a bunch of ass clowns. We spanked their ass in 2004. We'll spank it again as soon as they let us take the handcuffs off and give the people that know how to get it done the permission to get it done. Well, we, let me tell you something. We can do this. We can do this in an amount of days. We've got the people to do it. We've, we, yeah, and we've done it before. Um, we've just got to make the decision clearly that that's what we want to do politically and then just go do it. So, why have I started this foundation? Why is there a book being written about my life? Why is there a country music song that's being written about the foundation? It all comes down to there's hundreds of thousands of contractors who are prior service military that don't get crap when they come home. I'm so proud that the military has all these foundations to compensate for the incompetence of uh, the VA. Um, that, that resembles, you know, a third world uh, witch doctor uh, type treatment. You know, I'm glad that we've got that. But you know what? Everybody that goes over there and puts herself in harm's way for our country um, deserves that. So we, we need to model what's happening for the military, for our contractors, and that's what Echelon, that's the essence of Echelon Gray Foundation. And it's my life mission now to make sure that happens. Um, the motto, no one gets left behind at home. Once everybody gets back, that's, that's when the demons start coming up, the drinking, the drugs, um, the sleepless nights, uh, all, all those different kind of things. And so that's when we need to have that safety net and people need to know that, uh, that they have options. Um, I wanna model the foundation off of the Huntsman's uh, Cancer Institute in Utah. Um, and everything that I was trying to figure out how to connect the dots and how to do this best, um, it's the best model or best template to, to try to do that. I want to erect um, a memorial for the 1,500 plus contractors who died so, so people, you know, warm-blooded Americans who've lost their loved ones over there have a place to go and get closure and mourn. Um, the same thing that we have for all of our military, there's no reason why we shouldn't have that for contractors, and we don't. And I want to change that. And I want to have a documentary. I want to have a Steven Spielberg uh, type documentary, you know, a tier one um, type documentary where we really capture the global war on terror and how security contractors have fought side by side with military, especially in the b beginning, and capture all those, you know, I've got a million, well, not a million, I've got 10, because I've got a bad memory, 10 really cool stories up here 
of my own experience that I won't have time to share today. But there's so many other people that's got five or ten too, and, and, and we need to capture that instead of, you know, just spending the next few years talking about, you know, um, you know one, uh, one segment of what happens over there, which really the popular uh, in the news and in the movies is, you know, SEAL Team this and SEAL Team that, you know, accolades to them. They, they've earned it, but that's one piece of the pie, but that's all we're talking about. We need, we need, you know, we need, to, talk, we need to talk about the two, four Marines, the infantry guys that were downtown uh, with General Mattis um, in 2004, fighting for their lives every day, and every, not one cool mission, but fighting for their lives every day and every night and doing things that people, and I was right there beside them uh, doing it with them. Those stories need to be told. You like my Ricky Bobby thing here? Like, uh, please, thank, you know, that, that's kind of my humor. That. So where are we at? We're pending federal approval, you know, blah, 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 woof, woof, woof. What we really need is we need people with means, people that are patriotic, um, people that want to help out to step in and really help us get some momentum. You know, I mean, a facility like that's probably going to co cost a couple hundred million dollars, probably going to take two or three years to build. So these are real serious goals that I have, and it's going to take real serious people. Um, to help me get it done. Richard Ridley on the left, if you like fiction, you know, Harry Potter type stuff. Um, he's got seven or eight really cool books out. Um, he's writing the book Fire and Forget Soldier about my life. Um, dear friend of uh, um, Vice Principal Quick. Quick. All right, Jason. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, uh, and on the right, is a good friend of mine, Stan Allen. He's a he's a veteran, and he's writing the written the country music song um, "Forward," which is my life motto now. Uh, Move forward, unafraid. Um, it's based off of security contractors, and uh, the song's based off of uh, Team Miami, and it, it should be out in a few weeks. Um, so that's a brief story of my life. Okay, now we're going to talk about your life. Think about it. If you had to come up here in 20 years and talk about your life to a group, what would it sound like? Would it be like, oh, and then we went to Walmart, and I forgot to fill up my gas tank. That, really, that's about all that's happened this week, you know? I mean, is, is it going to sound like that, or is it, is it going to be something that you get excited about and want to get up here and talk about, or is it going to be something embarrassing? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll tell you what. You're the only one that can write the pages of your story every day, and that's what every day is. Every day you're defining yourself whether you know it or not, and you're writing your story. So, it's your life, you get to fill the pages. We basically, I'm gonna give you three tools today to try to help you do that. How are we on time, Colonel? Pretty good, you got 25. Okay. Uh, tools for your toolbox. I love Einstein, right? Real smart toolbox. We're talking about your head, you know, tools that you can use that are stored up here. Um, and uh, I, I just wanna make sure everybody kind of connected that, you know, tools for your toolbox, that's kind of what I was talking about. So, you know, tools, you know, most leaders today are very manipulative. Um, uh, you know, they don't have that true, honest to goodness, um, patriotic, um, positive leadership that, that we may see in what our, our forefathers had. They were willing to sacrifice everything, reputation, wealth, their life, their family, just for the idea of something better. Um, that doesn't exist today because you know, it doesn't. As soon as you get comfortable, you, you can be an Olympic athlete, and I can put you in an environment where you can get lazy and you'll get comfortable, and it's like, next thing you know, you change. And so I get all that, but, but that's, not, that's not the point of when I, I digress. So um, it's important to understand the difference between positive tools and negative tools. So I'm going to give you three positive tools today, but I'm also going to talk about, you know, the counter to that, the negative tools. Um, it's important to understand that you get to decide which tools um, that you use. Tool number one, don't use the F word. You can use the other F word, but don't use the fair word. Because life isn't fair. It doesn't exist in nature. You know, do you think it was fair for the people that went to work to th that day, just trying to work and make a living and raise their family, and they had to jump to their death for no reason? I mean, that didn't have to happen. So is it fair to anybody? No, life's not fair. Is it fair uh, when your dad's killed in a car wreck? Is it fair when your mother loses her job or gets breast cancer? Is it fair that your best friend's uh, more popular or better looking or taller? 
You know, life's not fair. It's not fair when that cheetah cub gets a little lost and gets eaten by the lion. That's not fair, right? But that's nature. Fair does not exist in nature. It's a human thing, and it's something we want and we're striving for, but you can't count on it. The mirror. Even the adults in this room will tell you it's hard to do. I'm not talking about looking the mirror from a narcissistic standpoint like, damn. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about looking in your soul, looking in your eyes, watching them water because you're getting emotional because you know that you're living a lie and you're not doing everything that you should be doing the right way. I'm talking about looking in the mirror and fixing yourself. And I'll tell you what, I guarantee you most of them the rest of your life will think about it and you won't do it because it's a lot easier to lie to yourself. But if you want to be a good person and do great things, you visit that mirror. You keep yourself in check and uh, you figure, you sort yourself out. Excuses and insecurities and cognitive dissonance. I love cognitive dissonance. Does, does everybody here know what cognitive dissonance is? I, I'm going to give you an example because I'm not smart, so I have to keep things simple. You know, the, the story when you Google it, Bump that guy. Hey, if you get sleepy, just stand up for respect for me. If you get sleepy, just stand out of, uh, up out of respect for me. And that way, if you fall asleep, you'll fall down. Okay, that's all I ask. Just step up and step to the side. If you feel yourself getting sleepy, just have enough discipline to do that. Like that guy right back there that's out. Why don't you just stand up for me um, if you can't stay awake, okay? Um, so I got up at 3 o'clock this morning to make it here today. And uh, I'm, I'm doing fine, so I think you guys can handle it. Um, cognitive dissonance is when you're going along and, you know, you ever heard the thing with the low-hanging fruit? You know, it's easy to get, but the high-hanging fruit's hard to get, so you make excuses of why, oh, that high-hanging fruit, it ain't no count anyways. It's sour. I don't want it. You talk yourself out of it when you know that that's the best stuff. You know what I mean? Apply that to yourself. Don't, don't, don't lie to yourself. Don't kid yourself. You're going to spend 20 years chasing your own tail for no reason, and, 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 and then you're going to finally figure it out. Leadership, positive and negative. Here's the three things you need to know about leadership. Bump her. Lead by example. Never ask or order somebody to do something you haven't or are not willing to do yourself. Take responsibility for everything you do and don't do. You must set the standard, live the standard, then you can uphold the standard. You hear this stuff about double standards. You know, you see in the news, it's a question of whether Hillary, Hillary Clinton has her own rules and everybody else doesn't, and that double standard. Well, you know what, if you live the standard, if you set the example, then you can uphold the standard. And there's never gonna be a question of a double standard. Sheryl Sandberg is my favorite boss of all time. Worked at Facebook for a year, protected her some while I was there. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. And when I look and filter leadership tools, here's the things that I go through. You can read them yourself. Not one place on there when I look at somebody for leadership or to be a boss, not one place in there is there a question, is she a female? Are they white or black? What religion are they? I don't have a filter for gender and race and religion. I was brought up in the military. It doesn't matter what you look like. Are you a good leader? Are you a bad leader? And there is my checklist. You either pass it or you fail it. And if you happen to be a woman or you happen to be black, well, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with that. You failed my checklist of whether you're a good, a good leader or not. Those are positive tools. There's no way anybody, the reason why I'm not politically correct, correct is because I'm not racist and I know I'm not. I'm not gender biased, I know I'm not. That's my favorite boss in this whole planet. She's a female, she's the real damn deal. You know what I'm saying? You guys, you guys connecting the dots there? You know, if you know your heart and you have a way of filtering in the right tools then you can, you can know that what you're doing is right and just and feel good about yourself. 
At the end of the day, when you get my age, it's about feeling good about yourself and not from taking weird drugs and hanging out with weird people. I'm talking about feeling good about yourself from coming from a good place and knowing that you're a good person and that you lived a good life. You may not have been perfect, but you lived a good life and you did the best you could. Negative tools, lying and cheating for your own personal agenda. All you got to do is watch the news and you'll see examples of negative tools, ways of manipulating, um, political correctness, false narratives, when somebody misuses the race card for their personal gain or, or for this, that, and the other, instead of the better good of uniting the country and making things uh, uh, as equal and uh, as appropriate as possible. Uh, picking lead, uh, yeah, and, and, and if you pick somebody, like if, I, if I'm a female and I pick you because it's like, well, you're the only female in the option, I'm being gender biased. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, just because she's a female and I'm a female does, it still doesn't make it right. I have to pick the best person for the job regardless of what I am or regardless of what they are as accordance to what, what, you know, what really matters which is their capabilities, you know, where do they fall? You know, do you want somebody leading you up a hill in combat that is popular so that you're politically correct? Or do you want somebody that knows what the hell they're doing when they get to the top of that hill and there's 20 people up there trying to kill you? Which one do y'all want? It's rhetorical. My views on politics, Lee, what tools do you think I use? What, I already answered. What tools do you think I use? I'm good? Okay, what, what tools do you think I use? All positive filters that are defendable. Defendable in my heart and defendable the product, uh, you know, wh whatever the outcome is. I can defend that because there's my checklist. I actually have a checklist. Those are my tools. Here's an example. Now, why do I lean towards the Republican Party? I do have a bias. And you know why? Because I'm a military man. There's no way that I can support leadership, somebody that's going to send somebody the harm's way that isn't pro-military and pro-America. So I do for that very reason. If the Democratic Party was pro-military, I'd be a Democrat. Because there's no way I can't not support, because I know what a sacrifice that is. I spent nine years in combat. If we're going to have a military and we're going to use them, we have to support them. Because you know what? Some of these people in the room, it, it's not like the military are different people. They're us. They're, there's people in this room right now that are going to be serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we're all one. This is the United States of America, and we should act like it. Again, there's nowhere in my thought, you look at my checklist, there's nowhere in there race, gender, and religion. You need to do the same thing. You need to have positive tools. If you've got some kind of racial bias, some kind of problem, women can't do it, get over it. Be, be better than that. And you know what? Be brave enough to go, I know you're a woman, and it's not because you're a woman. You just suck at this, and that's why you're not getting a job. Be brave enough to do that, too. You know, be a good person. Be a good leader. All right, this, is a, this topic gets me pissed off about Benghazi, but... Given my filters, what do, you think about, what do you think I think about the current affairs? Obviously, you already know that, so I'm going to skip it before I get madder. Um, uh, to better prove my point, here's a, a Muslim leader. This is an awesome guy. He, he was a wrestler, went to high school in, in the United States, King of Jordan. Um, Israeli leader, prime minister. I'd go right now, I'd stop this brief, go right now and, and, and uh, go fight with either one of those guys. Has nothing to do with one of, them's, uh, one of them's from Jordan, one of them's from Israel. One, has nothing to do with that. They inspire me. And you know why they inspire me? Because they love their country and I can feel it. It's palatable. They're willing to go on the front lines and fly missions and fight. You know, you know he was wounded and his brother was killed in a special mission when he was in the military. You know, I don't want to get long wind on that, but these guys are the real deal. That, that's what I demand, and you need to demand it too. People that are in charge of you, entrusted um, to mentor you and take care of you, you need to demand it of yourself and of the people around you. Write these things down if you want to. If, if you, if, 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 
you know, if you think it's going to matter, don't use the F word. Look in the mirror. You're responsible for everything you do and don't do. And if you're going to be a leader, lead by example and don't lead by a double standard. This is my granddaughter. I'm a granddad. Y'all are supposed to go, oh, you don't look old enough to be a granddad. Okay, I know that's what you're thinking, so I'll go ahead and say it. Um, but here, here's, here's what I like to say. Her name's Bella. I'm tickled to death. That's the, my, my most proudest thing right now in life. Um, uh, you want to enjoy your life, and at least have the proper tools, obviously. Um, but think about it. What do you got in this life? Nudge him right there before I fall asleep. Um, what, think about it. What do you have in this life? You got today, and you have your memories. Stop, stop thinking about all that other crazy stuff. What do you have in life? You have what you're doing right now and your memories. And as your life goes on, all you're going to have is day by day an opportunity to change it and memories. So the more crappy memories you make, the more crappier you're going to feel about yourself. Every day is a new day, and that's all you have is the day you're in because tomorrow's promise to no one. And I, I don't care where you came from or what your situation is. When you turn 18 and you go out into the real world, whatever happens with your life is nobody's fault but yours. So visit that mirror and keep that in mind. It ain't my fault. It ain't society's fault. It's not the government's fault. You are a grown person. Think of Helen Keller. Helen, Ke Helen Keller, by the way, is my favorite woman in the world. Look at what she overcame. I mean, you, you got ten fingers, you can see, you can hear. Well, I mean, what? what? What's your excuse? You know, you need to get some fire in your gut and be somebody. And I'm not saying that from a b bad place. I'm saying it from a good place. Everybody in this dadgum room can live their dreams. You got to believe in yourself. You got to stop being scared. You got to stop listening to everybody else. You got to figure it out and find a way. There's always a way, I'm telling you. Don't let anybody steal the gem from your donut. How many days have you been happy and you text somebody and you show up and you're all happy and they're like, damn, that person's happy. I don't like that. I need to bring them back down to where I'm at so I can feel better about myself. How many times has somebody stole your happiness? Well, the way I remember it, that's one of my tools for my tool toolbox. Don't let people steal the gem from your donut. So, so when I'm in a good mood, which is Basically, every day I wake up, to, as soon as I'm like, oh, I got, little, I got all kinds of little protection things out there. And I'm like, oh, I'm being infiltrated. Somebody's trying to steal the gem from my donut. And, I, and over the years, I've got ways of mitigating that. I'm telling you right now, don't wait 20 years and be a dumbass like me. Figure it out right now. Start caring right now. Don't let people steal your happiness, okay? Facebook, Sheryl Sandberg. Again, love her to death. I can hear her saying this right now to a big group of people. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Now, some of you are like, well, you know, I don't want to be a pilot because I'm scared of, uh, you know, flying. Or I don't want to be uh, a doctor because I'm scared of blood. Or, you know, you got an excuse for everything. If you didn't have an excuse for everything and you weren't scared, what would you do? It's a rhetorical question. Answer it yourself and then go out and do it.